Hello and welcome to the Cuyamunga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach. And of course, on behalf of our Board of Directors, Advisors and Volunteers, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Cuyamunga Institute is an independent nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, uh, conserving and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life, so it's part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. And as an educational institution, we take an open approach. We invite scholars and related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this Conversation for Exploration, these weekly discussions are available on demand. Many of them, at least, are, are, are available on demand. We have a couple hundred presentations between webcasts, YouTube podcasts, et cetera. And all these presentations are free. And of course, as a nonprofit, we want to invite you to become a supporting member. And we thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Cuyamunga Institute. Today, we're returning to the fundamental foundation of what this institute came into existence because of. It's that idea and the original discovery by Dr. Felicitas Goodman, the founder of this institute, that ancient artifacts may indeed be encoded with ritual instructions. What if the language of ritual is embedded that not only can we provide additional understanding of what a culture is expressing through their art, but that encoded information is a tool for experiencing altered states of consciousness? And indeed, we'll dive into that today, this connection between the historic and the contemporary with our guest, Professor of Anthropology, uh, Christine Van Poole. She teaches with her husband, Todd, at the University of Missouri, and together they spent decades researching the Casa Grandes culture, which once flourished along the border of Mexico and the American Southwest. Chris and Todd are members of our Cuyamaga Institute community. They're on our advisory panel. And Chris is a practitioner of our work with ritual postures. And it's this direct experience of a practice that among other categories of experience often leads us into soul flight that among many other data research points, all this in part inspired the paper that Christine just published on a more in-depth understanding of the relationships between ritual objects and the shamanic culture that made and used them, and why. Deeply insightful reading of the iconography, the cosmology, and that directly ties this iconography to the experiences and the purpose of this shamanic culture. It's about art that is not art in the Western sense, but art and artifacts as part of the ritual activity that elucidated the duty and the role of the shamans to stir the portals between the realms, to interact with these dimensions and these dimensional beings, to help write the relations of a people to their environment and their cosmos. And how nicely this vernacular was spelled out with an internal logic within the culture, with symbols that all could read at that time, and can therefore today be decoded once you have the keys. So it's our pleasure to once again welcome Christine and Todd Van Poel. And uh, this is part of a paper that Christine just published, but she's uh, here today with a slideshow uh, to help really understand this connection. Part of this being her experiences with our practice leading to further insights sure. into that culture and these artifacts. Hi, Christine, welcome back. Welcome to both of you. And it's really exciting for us to continue the research of, of what Dr. Goodman put on the table as, as, a, as a hypothesis, an understanding that possibly artifacts themselves and what's being encoded can have some kind of resonant effect on us. And we're using the term altered states of consciousness that we can bring ourselves into an altered state of experience. And how universal those states can be. Yeah. yeah. 
So tell us about all this new, well, and this is groundbreaking. You just mentioned that you don't think anybody's ever published quite this collection of insights and data before. So congratulations. Oh, yeah. thank you. And thanks for having us. Um, do you want me to start the slideshow or do you want to talk tell about us a little bit about what you're doing? What, yeah, what, what, what led you down see? this path? What yeah. led you down this particular path? <laughs> um, for Casas Grandes Archaeology, we were at the University of New Mexico for graduate school and we were working with uh, Robert Leonard, was Todd's advisor, and he went from Zuni, New Mexico. So Todd and I spent a couple of years out at Zuni, New Mexico. Then we transitioned to Chihuahua, Mexico. And I went down in 1996. Todd had been there a year or two before in the summer, but I was doing contract archaeology. But I went down in 1996 and I just fell in love with the pottery. And when I first started, looking at the pottery, I thought I would do a technological study, but everyone kept saying, you need to do an iconographic study. Nobody's done an iconographic study. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'll try that. And that led me to photographing a whole lot of um, pottery in various museums. I photographed pottery in seven or eight museums. Since then, I visit more museum. I actually am sitting on about 9,000 images of pottery. Now, when I say 9,000 images, it's not that many pots. It's just, I actually take pictures from the top, all the sides and the bottoms. I think there's information that we can always, yeah. maybe not the time when I photograph it understood, but I'm really thankful that in the 1990s, I was photographing every aspect of pot. And that's how I've been building these arguments by understanding the iconography. So I owe a big thanks to uh, David Phillips was one of my mentors. He was the director of the Maxwell Museum, and he's one of the people that said, Chris, you need to study the iconography. Actually, he told me, you have to go to grad school, Chris. You can't just do a contract archaeology. He was so sweet. He's like, you're too good to just be a shovel bum. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but then when I came back from Chihuahua, I saw David again, who I'd been working with for a while in contract archaeology. He was with SWCA, which I work for. But I told him how I was so excited about the pottery. He goes, I have something for you. And he handed me a box, a Rubbermaid style box. And in it was photographs from the Museum of New Mexico, the Laboratory of Anthropology of Costas Grandes Pots and pottery. He photographed the Smithsonian. He goes, here's what I figured out thus far. Here, have it. And he was on my doctorate committee. And it's really been fun because I, I still talk to him occasionally when I remember to no, just kidding. Um, he's, he's really hard to catch. He's retired now. But anyway, um, I expand is so much more than what Dave Phillips had had done on the Costas Granda stuff. And we have a uh, edited volume together with David Phillips on the religion of the Southwest. We have a couple of papers. I have a paper with David and Pottery Southwest where we talk about people that painted the pots, did something with a certain type of sandal, and we think that denotes one potter. And um, mm -hmm. David Phillips has been such an inspiration to me with. Um, my my work and then uh garth bottom was a chair of my committee one day i went into garth and i said i think i have shamans i think i have a shamanic thing going on shamans and i showed him he said this is great you can write one chapter only in your dissertation on shamans do what you originally said on the symbolism of casas grandes mm -hmm. but then after you graduate go write a book on shamans so that's what todd and i did together after um we graduated we wrote um, Signs of the Costas Grandes Shamans. It was published by BYU in 2007. And at the time, I understood the ideas of how important these postures are that shamans get into. And that's part of m one of the ways in which people go into altered states. And that's been that Todd and I have been working on, which he last time he presented, he talked about his pie chart with all the different things that help with these um, rituals and altered states of consciousness. So that's a really fast overview, and I'm sure I'm forgetting something along the way, but <laughs> you want to add anything to that, Todd? No. So this has been, um, so, and it's interesting how one word, oh, go study the iconography and what you've done with it and how it's led to to all of this. Isn't it wonderful, those crossroads that we come to and then the paths that we're, that we're led to? Um, yeah, it is use. interesting then. The paper that we're going to talk about today, um, David, Ferdell is a Maya archaeologist, and I had met David Ferdell at the Santa Fe Institute. I was invited for our Indian Cosmologies and Society many years ago, and I got to know David Ferdell over many breakfasts, lunches, dinners. And at one point, David Ferdell said, Chris, 
you have such great stories and you have so much information you intuitively understand the shamanism you really have to get out there and you have to be publishing and you need to publish some of your own personal st stories with your and he was the first person to ever call me a mystic and i was like whoa just <laughs> whoa, I'm not a mystic i'm like you know that was in the world of science you don't call somebody that but things happen and i i finally um agree with david uh Friedel. maybe i'm a mystic maybe i should just own it anyway so it's just curious how all this kept coming in and the synchronicities that are at work within uh, research and me meeting people along the way, meeting you guys, um, having people say different things. And then always, my life is full of people pushing me. Um, David Friedel yeah. saying, you have to publish this. David Phillips saying, you have to go to grad school. And I have a lot of David and Todd's mm -hmm. in my life, but <laughs> I've definitely had a lot of, and, and women too. I, I had some People a long time ago kept telling me, you have to go to college, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I'm like, okay. Anyway, but it's been a wonderful life with so many people um, mm. surrounding me and encouraging me to do the things I do. And the biggest encouragement is right here, Todd. He's always encouraged me and he accepts job, Todd. <laughs> for all I am and all I do. And we work well together, thankfully. It's been a lot of fun. Even well, though really hot days in there, 120 yeah. degrees, Chihuahua. How we ended up sticking together is is, is is fun. Well, I love you, but you brought up the word mystic and the, that intuitive aspect that you found within yourself. Because I was sitting here as you were beginning to tell this to her, and I said, "God, you just it just it's coming and it's coming from within you. It's something that just you're driven by. This is not just a scholarship to make to make a dollar. This is something that goes way beyond. That it's yeah. something that it, it's fundamental to who you are as a person. And I know several people in the chat room immediately jumped on and said, "Love the fact that you're claiming to being a mystic." I mean, and so that Goodman had to make that that transition as well from from being just a, a strictly representing a, a, a uh, the aspect of being a. a, a um, well, it's anthropologist, helpful. It's helpful but also to understand from the inside out right, what but, you're what you're studying, right? right? The full right. dimension of it, right? And mysticism is getting a little bit more accepted in the academic world. I'm assuming it's a data point, right? It's just part of the overall picture of the many mm -hmm. layered, yeah, uh, yeah, aspects so, to so. a study. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so. Anyway, that 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 just really wonderful that you and bring the point forward. Thank you for crediting your uh, work with this institute as part, as part of, of the insight of the of the research that you've done. But we also hear yeah. that that story began very early on. This yes. is not a recent thing, but it's great that our work is dovetailed. And maybe that intuitive quality yeah. that you talk about being a mystic brought you to this work and those two yeah. combined. So. Tell us about your, what is this new discovery, this yeah. new insight, Le multi? I mean, you had the insight, but there are added layers now mm. to this vernacular of this iconography, these pots, they're speaking to you in new ways. Can you tell us that story? Should I do a PowerPoint? Sure. sure. Yeah. I don't know. I think best with pictures. Um, I <laughs> Well, since it's such a visual medium too. It yeah. is. It is. And I think that also drew, drew me to it because yeah, it great. is, um, thank you, dear. So um, I'm, I'm just going to kind of give a more academic brief talk but please ask questions please stop me anybody um when when we if i'm not being very clear but this is uh, a really lovely and we're not supposed to say those words in science beautiful lovely um but casas grandis pottery is uh a polychrome so it's black on red and it's just full of all kind of imagery i love this little guy i don't know can you see my cursor moving yes we can Oh, wonderful. That makes it easier too. With these birds that might represent uh, another type of bird, and we'll get into this in, in a minute, different types of images, but I show this one because it's a macaw effigy and it's got spirals here, triangles that turn into spirals, some type of curious little bird on it. I'll explain that in a little bit. But this, these are made in Casas Grandes, Chihuahua, Mexico. And as uh, Laura said absolutely correctly, the Casas Grandes region, the culture, we tend to think of it medio AD 1200 to 1450. It spans northern Chihuahua and into New Mexico. Our site, 76 Draw, where we've been excavating is six miles north of the border, south of Demi, New Mexico. And we now call the heartland, the main site, Pakime, 
because in Arizona, we have a site that's Casa Grande, meaning one big house where Casas Grandes is many big houses. So many big houses. And then the regional uh, center is, is Pakime. There's a lot of debates. All archaeologists, we love to debate, don't we? Mm -hmm. But there's good evidence to think that a lot of the pottery is made in the core area. I think that we have pottery being made up in the, in the what we might call uh, the American Southwest. Our anthropologists uh, did these cultural areas, and it's based on environment, adaptations, or type of house, what you're raising, corn, beans, and squash like that. And so this part of the world by cultural anthropologists and archaeologists called the American Southwest. So the American Southwest goes from Las Vegas, New Mexico, to Las Vegas, Nevada, and it goes from Durango, Colorado to Durango State of Mexico. And that makes this a huge greater Southwest or the American Southwest. So that means even though we work in the political country of, of um, Mexico, we're actually considered Southwest archaeologists because the environment's so much closer. It's an ab arbitrary border with political, but culturally speaking, this becomes um, uh, American Southwest. So just to kind of review what I've already done. So this was what made me excited one day. I had these smoker effigies of males. There's no doubt they're males. And I got thinking, wait a minute. I've seen that sign, something like a hashtag or TikTok toe board pound sign and other on other images. And I went hunting through, at that point, probably a couple thousand of photos. And I was looking at it and there's a subset of these hashtags on these individuals smoking with a headdress and an unusual stance, again on this thing metamorphizing and again on an anthropomorph with the mocha head. So I went to my advisor, Garpa, and said, I think I have shamans. I think it's showing a shamanic transformation from doing all the things that shamans do, fasting, um, not eating certain foods, dancing, praying, chanting, drumming, probably rattling, all those things to have this um, ability to travel into the spirit world. And I based it on this, this pound sign, which if you listen to art historians, usually you have to have a cluster of images that unite them. But the Casas Grandes people didn't get that memo. They just based it on one curious pound sign. This is very rarely on a female, and they're almost always on males. They're in this iconography. So the pound sign is pretty much limited to males smoking, probably hallucinogenic tobacco, nicotine, arusca. Um, we're finding evidence archaeologically all over North America that it actually got up into the Americas by 3,000 years ago. So people are smoking hallucinogenic tobacco, which will make you go catatonic and you really think you're flying. It also knocks out the color receptors so that things, if you're awake and looking with your color receptors out, you're very black and white and everything looks ghost-like. Even if you're looking at a real person, they look ghost-like. So Gar said, yeah, I think you're onto something. Only write one chapter and go do the research. Look at Douglas, Sharon, and other people in South America. Look at their shamanic practices. And the more I learned about shamanism, the more the pottery made sense. And so one of the things that really struck me was this bird on the leg of this transformed shaman. Shamans usually, the spirits choose who will become a shaman, what they can or can't do, and they'll help them with, with knowledge. And they're called guardian spirits or tutelary spirits traveling with this bird. And I learned that through my work with uh, South American shamanism as I was reading about. And then I thought, wow, the Casas Grandes uh, people are showing that. The other thing we know when... Um, so let me interject here real quick um, to... Uh, 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 help stress some of the things that Chris was talking about. So if you start here at the bottom, you see the individual smoking the, the, if you look closely, you can actually see it's, he's holding a, a pipe and we see these sorts of pipes at Pakime across the Casa Grande region and even on up into other areas in the Southwest. They're frequently called cloud blowers and tobacco is richly consumed across the Southwest. In fact, across North and South America, tobacco is sometimes referred to as the, the, the only thing that even the gods are addicted to. Um, and so it's a, uh, it's a very important ritual uh, substance that's that's used to purify a location or not. But tobacco can also create extremely profound uh, visions, uh, hallucinations or visions or or uh, however you might wish to phrase it. It's a, a powerful entheogen. 
And so, especially when you smoke this powerful form of uh, tobacco, it will literally knock you out, cause you to lose unconsciousness, cause people to enter into these altered states of consciousness and experience these powerful visions uh, that are typically cross-culturally uh, across the Americas interpreted as being able to go to and interact with the spirit world. So if you look here, you see the individual smoking the, the pipe. Then next to it, you see the individual wearing sort of a headdress and an odd pose, a dancing pose or whatnot. And again, you can link them because of that pound sign. Then next to it, you see the headdress off to the side. And the individual himself is literally transforming into what he'd only previously sort of represented. And so that is showing this kind of spiritual transformation. Then up above it, you see the, the macaw-headed anthropomorph with the pound sign, the tutelary bird that, that Chris was talking about. This sort of imagery is unique to Pakime in the sense of the specific images, but this sort of imagery is found across North and South America in many different groups where uh, the, to the tobacco is used to initiate these sorts of divine experiences where people can travel into the spirit world. This is very common um, when you look in South America, especially, but on into uh, Mesoamerica um, and po possibly even into places like the, the Southeast around uh, where we are in, in Missouri. It's entirely possible that they were doing similar search practices in this region. Mm. Absolutely. In fact, I have a friend, um, P.D. Newman, who has a book coming out um, in the next few months, and I wrote the foreword. He thinks that the people here in the Mississippian world is what we call it archaeologically in this part of the world. They're taking powerful hallucinogenic um, plants to have these type of visitations to the land of the spirits uh, anyway, but that, that will be coming out. So I think he makes a really good case for this type of uh, soul journeys, shamanic journeys happening here in the Mississippian culture. I'm looking forward to that book being come out. We'll have more on that hopefully soon. Yeah. And so one of the things that shaman, thank you, Todd, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. One of the things that David Lewis Williams in 1988 in a current anthropology article talked about was often when you're um, taking um, plant medicine, ethnogens, or even with things like LSD and things like that, often there may be really, it, it depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it, but you might see these atopic images. That means things seen in the mind, they're not there. Um, I didn't have a good, these I drew myself just throwing them out there, but you can have honeycomb style grids. You can have netting, uh, lines, zigzags, arcs, uh, bubbles, uh, globes, and of course, the, the spiral. These are things that, sorry, my mouse is acting up, um, that we see in altered states of consciousness or in these um, different brain shifts into different layers of consciousness. And this is something I think that the good men found, you guys continually find, that mm -hmm where it can be in these um, other places. And sometimes, and, and one of the things that I was really struck with, one of my very, the first couple of times I tried the ritual body postures, I really couldn't get into trance and couldn't have a vision. But there are some postures since then I started doing it, but there are some times where I'll hold a posture and I just feel myself spinning so fast, so powerful, spinning out into the cosmos. And sometimes it's like, you know, I'm just like, watch out. And so I know that for Such me- Such a common experience, that and spirals. Yeah, yeah. I will see the spirals, I'll become the spirals, and I'll feel myself spiraling, spinning up um, yeah. into the into the cosmos. But these are also, we tend to talk, if we see them visually, we call them entoptic phenomena. But I also think they're perceptual too, in the case of feeling like we're spinning or becoming a snake or, or those type of things. I think it goes far beyond the entoptic phenomenon. But. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And one of the things when I was putting together this stuff in the late 1990s, early 2000, was this is an entire uh, boya, it's a jar, but you're looking at the top of the jar, the bottom of the jar in a rollout. So you're seeing all sides, tops, and mostly the, the bottom where I created from a rollout what we're seeing. But so we have, have to spin the pot even just to read the whole thing, the whole exactly. script. Exactly. And so yeah. how these are taken is you put the pot on a record player and at the same shutter speed, I don't do that. And Justin Kerr did this one. And then I went back from an old Polaroid to figure out the colors. And I bought the Justin Kerr rollout where he photographed it um, with the right um, speed with it to create the the black and white image and then i went back through and sketched this then i colored it 
based on the actual pot itself. But what I loved about this, it has all the entopic imagery. So it has zigzags. So often zigzags, the mind starts trying. The mind, Our human brain is so incredibly powerful. It's always looking to create patterns, understand patterns as seen both within the natural world or in the, the other realms that we travel to. And this is a case where the zigzag, that's a huge zigzag. It's a horn. So it has a forward horn coming off the nose with the plume. So this is a horn plume serpent. So it's bird and snake like Quetzalcoatl. We don't know what the people there spoke. We don't know what language at Pocky may, but it's a horn plume serpent. And then just this incredible and topic imageries are all over it. One of the things we know in altered states of consciousness, you can see flights and flutters and bright lights and orbs. And so what I think is happening is you're seeing these fluttery lights. Often humans will uh, interpret these flashes and flutters as birds. So we have this oh. bubble-headed diamond macaw, and it's actually rotating in and of itself. These are often shown on just the entire pot. They're the center of the pot sometimes, uh, and they're spinning. And so you've got the head coming this way, and they're rolling. And so these things in other pots are rolling, double-headed diamond macaws. And then, of course, the tutelary bird helping. It's almost like he's speaking to and talking around this, this anthropomorph, which I think is a trans. Um, transform shaman again the pound signs on the there are pairs casas granis love pairs they do pairs of snakes pairs of birds pairs of shamans on their pottery when they paint them but again it's just showing every bit of this um and topic energy with the interpretation and with the human him and herself these i think are two spirits they're both male and female in the spirit realm because Birds are associated with women. Snakes are associated with macaws. We have males smoking, but in trance, they become the things that are represented with females. So they come both male and female in spirit. So macaws, female, and then a male body with uh, plumes coming out. And you can tell he's probably in some type of altered state where the body is contorting and twisting as it's in these this realm. Do you want to add anything to that, Todd? So... Um... The, there's an interesting juxtaposition here in terms of the art. And so there are things that are real in the world. So for example, humans are real and birds are real and whatnot. These things are frequently portrayed in uh, effigy, but not as commonly portrayed in painting. There are also things that, like the horned serpent, that are typically not visible in this world. Now, they may be real, uh, within the, the ontological framework, but they're not visible. You don't go down the, the road and see a, a horned serpent around, um, even if there is a horned serpent that is active within the region. When we look at the Casagrande's artistic tradition, the things that are typically hidden are almost always painted. So the spirit world is painted, whereas mm -hmm. when you actually look at the things that are real, things like macaws or turtles or whatnot, they're depicted in effigy. So like there's sculpted, this, so they're three dimensional, as exactly. opposed to a two dimensional painting, which kind of makes a logical sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it and does. the, the artists actually depicted that way. So I I can't obviously show every pot I've ever photographed. I wish I could, but at BYU there's a snake effigy, and it has the two snakes form coming up with their mouths open, and they're on both sides of the pot. But on this side is painted horn plume serpents that are flat. So even mm -hmm. on the iconography itself, we're showing the, the stuff in the spirit realm is, is 2D painted on the pot, but things you would find out if you're walking in the Casas Grandes landscape. Snakes, they're fully formed. And we're going to be looking at formed vessels in a second. But yeah, and so there's this incredible way that the artisans depicted things, how they looked at it, how they portrayed it. There's all kinds of information going on. Mm -hmm. um, but it I'd also denotes the cosmology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's, it's like a coded language right. that is Absolutely. painted that everybody understood, and it had to be in place for a long, long time. I would assume, right? It's Absolutely. not just one artist deciding this is what I'm going to do. It's it's a tradition that long standing. It looks like. Absolutely, and so when I started my dissertation, I said I want to be able to read the pots. I think I can read them, and I'm not going to name names, but there are a number of people at UNM. The, not Dave Phillips, our Garth Botten, our uh, Robert Leonard, they were all on my side. But there are people like, no, you can't do it. it you just can't do that approach. It's not going to work. And then after I got several publications out, they're like, we knew you could do it. But yes, so <laughs> I agree. And that was one of my fundamental premises was that this reflects cultural knowledge, 
a tradition, ideas about the natural world and what we might call a spirit world or the cosmology, would we be able to tease some of that out if we got enough, if I got my hands on enough pots and started sorting, I'd be able mm -hmm. to figure this out. And my first realm was just really a deductive science. So I stayed at a cousin's house in El Paso, Texas. I print up my pots and I put them on the floor and then um, I print them all out after I photographed them with digital technology, which was brand new back then. But I started clustering. I made folders, humans, birds, and then subfolders, mm -hmm. owls, um, macaws, a kill deer effigy. And I started cl collapsing them. And then I started seeing, you know, where I saw things, but I, there, nobody else had done that and, and looked at as many pots as I had. So I, it was definitely an inductive, but that was my whole premise. You said it so well, Laura, was that they're communicating. They're showing these thoughts and how the people saw their world and how they did the tradition and painted them. Oh, and the spinning. Now, your new paper is about they were spinning and the spinning is experiential. We do the spinning as well. Mm -hmm. And so now you're tying modern day uh, practices and those experiences with experiences of old. So that's breakthrough as well, Chris, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Paul Paul has something he'd like to well, I guess say, well, but before we go on to the spinning aspect of it, I also wanted to mention a couple of questions in, in the or at least comments in the chat room as well. One is the dots. The dots seem to appear in the circles in many places, and sometimes they don't. We've been we've been talking about the other imagery, but how do the dots play into the imagery and what and symbolism and, and uh, iconography? That's an hashtag. I wish I knew, and I have tried to tease it out um, from with and without. I cannot find a systematic way of answering that. I, I wish I could. That's one of those unknowns. Um, I can hypothesize. But again, um, it's really hard to tell what what they're what they might mean in in the past. And so, Carolyn is saying the Huicho Indians visualize the counterclockwise swirl as sending love out to the universe, and she's pointing out that Felicitas also said the counterclockwise brings in the spirit world. In fact, Felicitas, when we were getting smudged, would advise if you want to add this step, turn counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. It's like entering the door of this alternate reality. It's a gesture, another gesture to, right. to, um, to emphasize. Yeah. And I love Fred Smith. He showed a video during one of his guest lectures to you guys and showed a person who had gone into trance spinning counterclockwise. And he asked us in the community about that, how curious that is, but there's no doubt that these direction, directional spins mean a whole lot to the people. I think the present absence of the dot means something. Um, could be an axis mooney, a portal through which things are oh. going. Could be closed. It could be a difference between day and night. I just don't really know because it's not very clear. But all that is up soon. There are probably so much more that mm -hmm. is going on. Now, sometimes the, the dots, when we think something like this headband right here is running bands and in checkerboard. So looking at this guy's hat, headpiece, this tends to be how... Things are depicted with corn and feathers. So again, sometimes the, the checkerboards with the dots can be either rows of corn or they can be feather. Or in Mesoamerica, um, corn and feathers have a, a mixed metaphor. They're symbolically related. And so it, it could be all this stuff going on at the same time. Yeah. 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 Um, well, there's several other comments. I know Tony has about five questions. But is one... imagery limited to pots or do you also find the same in rock art? But you also point out that one of the motifs is laid out for the entire town of Pakime. It was laid into the landscape and the structure and shape of the buildings and their positions. Right. And so the horn plume serpent is a large effigy mound at, at Pakime. It serves both as a dam, if you will, and protects the site, site from runoff. And it had a huge head and one boulder uh, had an eye for a boulder that looked at the site and it had a bedrock mortar in it looking out. And then the other side had a closed eye, no hole. So again, one closed, nothing, one like eye looking, but we, the, a road cut through the, uh, aperture of the head. So we're not sure exactly which way that horn would have been pointed in the true nature because of damage to the site before they started excavating in 1958. But yeah, so yeah. And, and this stuff, it does show up in rock art. We have uh, humans holding parrots. We have horn plume serpents with uh, checkerboard collars, all kinds of stuff. So we see similar 
iconography, both in rock art and in sites, and probably was once in the murals. By 1958, the painted walls are eroded out. Early uh, Spanish explorers likened it to a city in Rome. The site itself had mosaic uh, stone pavements and the walls were painted. But by the time the De Peso uh, crew got out there, the murals were pretty much gone. We have some etching left where we know they probably had plaster and paint and they outline stuff, etches. We do have horn plume serpent etched in some of the rooms at Pocky May, but uh -huh. they're really faint. Um, I, I would I wish I could get in a time machine and, and go back. Um, it was probably just amazing. Yeah. Because um, imagine so. living in that built environment and everywhere you see there's symbology that you understand. Right. And so the mere process of just walking down that that lane and seeing it all, you are stirring it up. You are, that's yeah. a ritual in and of itself. It could be, right. okay. I mean, everything is, is a complete storyline written out mm -hmm. for you to activate like a it, song line. As an extension wow. to that comment. And we've also, lost so much of it. Yeah, as an extension to that, the question from Tony is that celestial meaning, would, it, would not the celestial be part of their world? This is the whole point of Christine's paper. Yeah. The celestial yeah. interaction and meaning of it and the the relationship between the two, mm -hmm. these spirit beings yeah. and humans. Absolutely. So, yeah. Should we keep going? Yes, yeah. please. Maybe that will help with some of Tony's um, thoughts and comments too as we, we start yeah. going. Stay yeah. tuned. It's we'll all you and I unfold and right here. Yeah. yeah, You heard it first here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we have really bright light coming in. I have to wear a hat because I'm getting blinded. Even my hat brim is not quite I, I think it's cute. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's better than me squinting. And Okay. So here's a great thing of um, obviously in the natural world of the here and now, the mundane world, you don't have macaw-headed snakes. So this is a snake body. It goes around the pot, has a two-fin tail, and it's macaw-headed. So one of my uh, committee members was Flor uh, Flora Clancy. She was the uh, chair of uh, the Department of Art History, and she was on my committee. She looked at it and said, well, there's your Ketsik bottle and uh, mm -hmm. Ketsikowat, the bird snake. I'm like, absolutely. So these could be qualified as a bird um, snake, Ketsikowatl. We also have the macaws. And so the macaws um, are formed. They're things that they kept at Pocky May. We have over 300 in burials at Pocky May. But this is just showing... The macaw, I absolutely love this guy. Um, this is a human macaw, and this is one of the few exceptions to the to the the exception that proves the rule almost. Mm -hmm. But here you have the macaw formed, you have the human form, and um, we have macaw stones so that the birds could peck out through the adobe. So they would have to put a big rock collar around. And the birds would couldn't peck through the rock. And to me, this looks like the macaw cage with the stone circle with life, some type of flower imagery is what I think. Um, other people think this is as well, maybe flower imagery here. I've always thought, yeah, this is a human riding a macaw during soul flight. But if you look at this, the wings, it, the, the body's going in upward trajectory. This mm -hmm. macaw its wings are an upward trajectory. So this thing is is lifting off, if you will, going up. His face, the this human's is face. Launch. Is, yeah. It is a launch. I, I agree. Absolutely, Laura. But I found this curious. I didn't notice this till I was drawing this. So I didn't have uh, permission to publish the image. So I just drew it out. And when I was drawing, I thought, oh, flip this, we might like this. That little eye is squinty, as I think almost in trance. So you have the the bird kind of squinting up and you have a male with the eyes squinting up, launching up into the spirit world. Interesting. And, um, Interesting. That's what I think. Uh, and we'll get back to the the feathers here. With she this. always wanted to pay attention to that look of the inward gaze that artists yeah. so often. Um, Depicted. Yeah. Yeah. And the macaws themselves. Now, obviously, when we have something that's meant to be an eyeball <laughs> and a pupil, it's pretty easy. Right here, we have the eyeball and the pupil on it as a circle with a dot. But here, it's definitely slanted. That's not, and I would say all my macaws uh, in effigy usually have just a center dot. They don't have this slash. So I think that is is telling us something about it, too. Interesting. So one of these layers that Laura was talking about, my paper is I'm building on layers. So we know that within shamanic cultures, things like what we would call regalia, they are painted with imagery and the imagery are the actual spirits themselves. They're not just painted pretty things, rather 
the spirit is being housed there. And so this becomes, if you will, a living, breathing thing with other living, breathing entities in it. One of the most famous are the shaman drums. They hold the shaman's double within it. So it is an animate being housing its own uh, shaman himself. And these become the boats are the animal, the shaman rides in altered states of consciousness. And so these are living things with their own spirits, with spirits helping spirits. So they come a collection of many spirits. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So um but as part of this, just kind of building on what Chris was saying there, that drum that the, the shaman is holding, this is from uh, Siberia, if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. that drum that the shaman is holding is itself a living entity, and as a living entity is a partner with the shaman. So you've got the shaman, but you also have this drum, and the drum and the, the shaman partner together to accomplish the tasks that the shaman does. But so it it's not just a tool, rather it's a living thing a living tool with its and, own and a hybrid relationship a hybrid and Absolutely. symbiotic relationship well yeah. it gets even more fascinating because this is also his soul his shadow so the human can have many selves many souls so this one is a case where it has a version of himself his own soul within the drum this is why these things were not technically supposed to be on display in moscow and anywhere else and why they're in some ways very dangerous to have because they have basically a soul within it of what was once a known human person with an that agency soul, and with influence yeah. and power absolutely so we have other cases and this is in topic imagery in this blue lattice I love this book. Um, this is, I guess, one might say in the good old days where you could do LSD and mushroom research in the 60s <laughs> and, and 70s. And we they had people, medical doctors, this comes out of a, a medical doctor's book. These are both medical doctors here, hallucination, behavior, and experience and theory. But early stages of marijuana and THC intoxication will have people seeing the grids, again, those grids, and then the grids start spinning and you're spiraling. And Siegel and West talked about the spiraling and then you'll pop through into another reality. Uh, Lewis Williams. Yeah, I'd and, say that's true. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so too. Having done that a few times with you guys, uh, Paul and Laura and other people in the room, we do that. I was flipping through this book not too long ago and I realized, wow, the shaman's paw stand itself is used to help the shaman portal and use pots to help them portal. And I thought, man, this is a, a 3D version of, of this right here going. And so we know that, that people can see these things in alter states of consciousness. They craft them into the material stuff and they use them to get soul flight or travel to the cosmos. These are one of the things that uh, Lewis Williams and Pierce suggest with soul flight to help. You want anything to that? Todd? So one of the things that has been really great with Christine working Sorry. with the sort of um, research that you all are doing in terms of the Go Among the Institute and working with uh, the, the ex experiential work here is that a lot of times you can look at things and you can read about things and you can know things, but if you haven't really experienced it, you don't have the insight that comes with seeing how everything goes together. So when Christine had, I, I had looked at this exact same image and Christine had talked about the Seagull and the West and the, the sorts of visions that people have when they're doing LSD or when they're involved in entheogens or even when they just simply get too hungry or for whatever reason enter, enter into altered states of consciousness. But one of the things that she found when she was actually working with you all and, and doing the uh, Goodman um, style uh, ritual body posture was this experience of actually going from this world Mm -hmm. through the sort of portal into another world. Yeah. And when she looked at these sorts of things, suddenly it meant something new. So even though she had looked at this before, suddenly she had some insight that's saying, I've experienced that and I understand what it means to go through that. And so, for example, <laughs> these, these, this pot holder here, which does not come from the Southwest, but is part of a shamanic tradition. And this is South American. It's South American. She's like, I get that in a way that I previously hadn't gotten before. I just simply thought of it. So when she was explained yeah. to me her idea when she was first working on this, she's like, you know, I'd always just thought of this as like a pot holder, and you know, mm -hmm. it's a great way to make a pot holder. But now looking at it, I understand why these are used for these specific pots and what it actually represents. Because in the same way with the Casas Grandes, 
when they're depicting yeah. the effigies that are are you know part of this world, then they've got the spirit painted images. They're actually reflecting that transition from this world into the spirit world. Well, and this reflects that same transition. And in, in other words, yeah. it's not it's not just simply that everything is all together and all at once. Rather, there's this transitional experience going mm-hmm. from my mm-hmm. consciousness, my state of consciousness, as it typically is, to the altered state of consciousness, transitioning into that spirit consciousness. And that is a literal transition that's symbolized by these sorts of spirals. I want to mention how an artifact jumped out at me in a museum with this very kind of relationship of, um, and it was a scythe, it was an early scythe that I'm told was used to cut grains. And it looked, and it was fashioned as the jawbone of the herbivores that would cut the grain and eat the grain. So here was this, this blade and they had actual deer teeth in it to be the cutting edge all laid out with the animal's head and ears, right? So they created the the herbivore that would eat it. I forget which one. And then here's the jawbone and here's its teeth. So it became a tool that could be held by the human and then cut the grain. And I thought, oh my God. So they're using the very animal's power and, and symbology and teeth as functional tool blade edges and they're recreating this this motion. Oh, I watch the animal come in and eat the grass, eat the grain. And here it is dried, same plant. And now I'm going to use its jawbone and its power and its permission, perhaps in the natural world to do so. And I'm going to employ that so that I can cut and gather the grain and 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 use it. I, I just thought, oh my God. To be that kind of relationship with your environment. Right. And to employ the powers of the animals around you and to do so respectfully and to say, I understand your power and your permission to do this. And now I'm going to, I'm, you're lending it to me because I can create this artifact and do so respectfully is what I'm maybe adding a few more layers, but I'm imagining that that, that was why it's purpose. And I thought, okay, maybe, maybe it was pre-metal. So those teeth would be, um, and maybe they sharp. I, I'm just like, oh my God. And you're right. It it takes the experience of it to understand and further decode these art of, art and artifacts. And I have to say that, and Goodman was very good at this as well. We look at folklore, and we can see the spirit journeying in the folklore. Mm-hmm. We can see the spirit journeying like everywhere. Once you've experienced it, you see it remnants of it in our culture that come down to, forward from the past. And I'm like, it's just it just such a brain buzz i don't know to to see all this it's so delightful to understand and see these depths but please continue no i was just going to say so in the mississippian world so like cahokia and other people in this part of the world the osage that's one of the way they did their thatch roofs was they would take a jawbone of a deer put it on a stick and then they swing it and that's actually we have that in the Americas, and that's how in the Mississippian world they actually uh, got all the grass cut for their thatched roofs here in the Mississippi. Uh, interesting. And so you can so, see the progression through time and how universal these dynamics are. This absolutely. relationship is, yeah, it just it just grows from our deep, deep, deep experience in early ancestors. So one of the things that's always fascinated me: there are some jars without a head that are incised and spirals and in the mid 1990s when i started my work i kept photographing these spinning just without a head jars i was so fascinated by them and i thought i think the fact that somebody took a knife or a shell or a rhyolite blade that's what they we have a lot of rhyolite in pocky may took a scraper uh, a rhyolite and and deliberately incised this thing and then rubbed it down while it's in a leather hard state, the pottery. But I kept thinking this is really important and I kept recording them. I found these with um, just plain jars, sometimes a human, but sometimes macaws. And I kept thinking they're important. I kept just photographing them because I'm such a nerd. But this is at the Amarin Foundation. And this is one of the cases where I take tops, bottoms all around to record stuff. And I'm really glad I did because when I was doing a trance with Kuyamunge about maybe two or three years ago, 
And we were doing a posture from Pocky Me that females are shown sitting with their legs out, just sitting there. And man, I spun crazily sp spinning and I spun in my stomach and I felt really sick. I spun so fast with you guys. And I thought, man, later I was thinking about what happens if this is just depicting it? So modern potters in the American Southwest talk about pots having lips, mouth, bodies, and tummies. And they use these words for the pottery. And I thought, what happens if their tummy is spinning, right? Like our spin in trance. And I got thinking, well, maybe he's spinning. There's also some use wear on this. It's too bad that they put like a fingernail polish down or white out to label it. But there's a lot of wear on the bottom. Notice that they're keeping them on a pot stand so you don't have it roll over off the shelf. Mm -hmm. So this is not something for moving on and off shelf. This was um, use wear. So I thought, wow, they're they're probably moving. And look at his face. I, I would like to think Felicitas <laughs> love this face. I think she'd be like, oh, looking up to the mm -hmm. cosmos. Mm -hmm. And that looks like an ecstatic trance face to me and i'll let you guys um vote on that but looks very happy eyes just looking up to the cosmos tony he's looking up to the cosmos but inward gaze as uh laura was saying but that upward stuff with maybe a spiraling stomach so you know, as though his face is slanted a little bit so that he's actively mm -hmm. spinning oh you could just point. see a, a yeah. bit of a sense one, of that. one cheeks like the wind's going yeah. by good point at an angle yeah and, and just to be clear about this, those there, as many people may know, uh, the folks in the Southwest made their pottery using a coil and scrape method or a paddle and anvil method. But in both sy systems, you do coil around the, the clay to make the, the pot oh, shape. Point. But yeah. in this particular case here, that's not what's going on. So you're not seeing coils there. What you're seeing is that they, they made the coils, they flattened the coils, and then they went back and as a separate step, created this incised pattern. Incisions. So that incised pattern for sure reflects the artist's desire to make that spiraling shape. That mm -hmm. That is for sure an intentional um, choice as opposed to just being the result of coils. Right, so the coils are gonna be running this way parallel to what would be the rim. The backside has that rim really nicely, but then they're getting scraped coming up like that. And Tony's hand keeps going up a lot. I can see him in there <laughs> going up. But yeah, so I think that these were deliberate design features of this, that they didn't have to do that extra step. Yeah. Do you want to bring on Tony? He keeps raising his hand. Sure. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll continue with the presentation and we're going to do a, a full amount of time to do Q&A as well. But yes, yes, a so timely we'll question is important. Oh, so go, Tony, go ahead and turn on your mic. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I actually was was uh, making different gestures with my hand to to look at it and think of different combinations of things, and then I was thinking of of how the 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 system of stars would appear to rotate around the pole, and, and oh, it, oh. All, it all began to connect here. Uh, lovely presentation. I should not divert you. Uh, you know, of course, I have curiosity since I've done quite a bit of cultural astronomy if there is any association with places where there's a uh, obvious solstice uh, uh, solstice rising or, or setting a, a, a ceremony going on. But well, uh, I have questions, but this is fascinating. Please continue. Thank okay. you. Thanks. I guess I saw that motion. Well, it looks like you're raising your hand. Um, yeah. Pocky May actually has a mound of a cross with circles around the cross with other platforms, and it's um, a solstice equinox marker. So we know they're out there doing things during those important times out at Pocky May. So you, one could imagine they're doing different types of activities, rituals on that Mount of the Cross um, effigy mound out there. But yes, and it lines up from mountains on both sides across the round platforms across onto the arms of the cross and then onto the next mound because they're not all one mound. There are four mounds around a cross and then they all line up to the mountains with markers on the mountain peaks themselves, all the above integrating a whole landscape, Tony. And so I could see this guy being out there as part of that. Perfect not just to say, but the, yeah. the representative of this. And we live in a spiral galaxy, so. Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. Yeah. And then I realized um, I hadn't really thought about it, but even in the form of the feathers, I think that the red lines are depicting the feathers. Is that the amaranth? And again, I think it's showing that upward soul flight. And so if humans can transfer and go to the cosmos, that these things are taking flight, lifting in a spirit realm, 
And the macaw, like a shaman, has to have a bird helper. So one of the things in the layer of my paper I suggested was these birds have a bit of human consciousness, their own volition. They can also take a soul journey, just like a human can take a soul journey. That Anyway, so this is the tutelary helper for this bird to make sure that the bird gets to the other realm and can come safely back and then uh -huh. know what it needs when it comes back. That's one of the things that the tutelary bird helpers probably help a shaman is they're getting all the information from things like the patron saint is not a patron saint, but the patron deity is what to pay. So said what, but anyway, so that they help uh, remember all the detail. Cause when you have something like a deity giving you a lot of information, it's hard to remember everyone. So if you can have your friend come here with you, it will help you remember more. So I think these are later tweet it in your ear. Exactly. Yeah. Tweet it in the ear. Literally. I think like you said, Laura tweet in the ear. Exactly. Again, this thing is showing its, its form with the upward flight spiraling around itself and then spirals on the effigy itself with that little helper bird. I don't think we've ever hosted a ritual body trance session with a group of people that a bird didn't show up to somebody. Yeah. Multiple birds often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is interesting. Birds are helpful. Mm -hmm. and especially talking birds but that's another discussion <laughs> one of these ones i photographed like the mid 1990s i was just so intrigued with it this one's better as far as the technology is concerned because you can see these interior um coils and this mm -hmm. is formation so these are how these are hand formed the uh coils in here but notice that they're taking some type of tool they're hitting it to look like it's corrugated and then they smooth it out. And we have really creative type names like rub corrugated <laughs> pottery, but I think that's it. And so they're making an artistic design showing that upward mm -hmm. spiraling. Here you can see the original coils they left here. Lots of use for on the bottom of it. I like how they created with the tail feathers here. They just took probably a comb or something and, and scraped it. Oops, sorry. Were there's those holes meaning the pot was suspended by cords? Well, sus one idea is they're suspended or you put something in it and then you tether it off so you can keep rodents and other things out of oh, your like a lid. You're you're so it could be either down way. A lid. Mm -hmm. And we do not have any wear marks on both of these. That's one of the things I did in my dissertation. There's not a lot of use wear and it doesn't look like they're hung probably, but they're mm -hmm. again I haven't looked at every single hole punch in Costas Grandis, but probably either hanging it or um, sealing it off mm -hmm. but again that deliberate upward spiral mm -hmm. and use wear on this too here's just another one at a different museum that i i photographed again and this one kind of like the male it is a design choice of incise instead of corrugated and again the coils will be running perpendicular or rather parallel to uh, the the rim on this one. And again, it looks like this upward slanting. And again, a lot of use were on, on this as it's spiraling itself. Then snakes, uh, one of my all-time favorite ones. And I suggested like in 2003 in a publication in American Antiquity that I thought these were, snakes are something that are always liminal. They come up, they can swim, they can transfer. Same thing with birds, they're liminal to the upper world. But snakes come up out of holes, but they're spiraling around this vessel. This is a case where their their form, their bodies were pushed out. Their mouths are open as if speaking or breath coming out, spiraling. So they're spinning up and out, mm -hmm. up and out of the, the ground, maybe a portal here. You can see a, a rattle on this one. It's probably a rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. These are probably, could be read as diamonds, so rattlesnakes here, mountain king snakes spiraling up. Not a lot of use for on this one. And then here's just another one of these. Go ahead, Todd. So going back to this one, this is showing exactly what, what Chris was talking about in terms of the, the actual objects you can go and you can see. If you, if you look here, these snakes are so well-formed, so well-designed that you can literally identify the species they come from. So you got the, the Sonoran Mountain King snake, and we can recognize that based upon its, its form and that, that, it's so distinctive. It corresponds in a one-to-one -one way with critters that we can go out and we can see. The same thing with the rattlesnake. Now, these are these are Style symbolically is. shown in the sense of uh, it isn't you know an exact. And it's not as if people are going through and making you know the exact replica of a rattlesnake. 
But if you understand the the way that they're being There's portrayed, enough identifying info on them, to exactly in the same way that you can look at a far side cartoon and you can say that's a cow, even though it doesn't look exactly yeah. like a biological textbooks version of a cow, you can recognize as having the right characteristics to be a cow. Same thing is is happening here. And this is in contrast to the sorts of things that we're seeing in the spirit world, where a lot of times they're being mixed. And we can still identify creatures. It's just those creatures don't correspond to one-to-one -one a particular um, mm -hmm. uh, object or a particular uh, animal that's found out in the, the real world. But what's interesting here, though, is that the sorts of critters that we're seeing involved in the spinning that, that Chris was talking about are these liminal creatures. And so you're seeing things like snakes that come out of the ground and that go underneath the ground, that live in the ground. They're underworld creatures. They can also swim, but we see them with the spinning motion. You see the birds with the spinning motion. You're not seeing a dog with this sort of spinning motion or something like that. Rather, the, the particular objects that are being reflected here um, and they could have portrayed coyotes. They could have portrayed dogs. They had both of those. They could they have portrayed full dog effigies, and they don't have anything like this. Please. Nothing like that. No so they're on the dogs. Yeah, they're intentionally choosing these sorts of creatures that are liminal that go into the sky or that go that into marry from Earth to Middle World and Middle World to the sky. So they're they're crossing the the worlds. And Absolutely. those are the ones associated with the spinning. Go ahead. Yes, they're and, and the humans too that can be. Uh, well, like a macaw-headed human, he's going to be liminal. He's going to be able to go to the, the he or she are going to be able to go to the different realms. Here's well, so just often we're down into Mother Earth and we're shooting up to the sky. So that it seems to be a role for the humans as well. We're yeah. traversing those three layers of reality. Yeah. yeah. And so this band here, red touch um, black. I think these are red touch black. Notice that red does not touch this yellow. That's discrete. That's the mountain king snake. And again, Circles and diamonds, a uh, rattlesnake, you can take a picture of them and their diamonds sometimes look like ovals. I have a picture of one in a ball court I should put in here, but again, these are probably symbolically, they're rattlesnakes with a rattle in, in the circles. Here's a, a highly, um, I'm sorry, highly um, stylistic one of a snake. This is a case where the um, these might be interpreted as scales and um, the scales of the snake and different, again, the the squares with dots, dots is something probably important to them. But again, their form, they come up out of that. Talking to a bird, I used to think, well, maybe they're eating the bird or about to eat the bird. But I think these are liminal creatures spanning and we find birds and snakes working together. We find human and birds working together. We find the bird and the macaw and the bird working together. So I think now I'd probably suggest that this rouse snake is having some type of communication with a helper bird that has human feet. So this is a bird with human feet on it, which is really curious too. Interesting. Oh. And then red touch yellow, these bands are red touch yellow. These are coral snakes. They are poisonous. But again, you can see where they're coiling up out of, of the pot, coming up probably out of the underworld, out of that portal, coming up into it. I really think they're doing something, playing with a... Uh, perhaps you know things that are you have to worry about in this world are rattles or these pattern bands with children maybe um teaching them but again these things are got their mouth open and, and moving but they're spiraling up again mm -hmm. so just to kind of think about this oh the smokers i think are wearing snake bands we know that modern people both in historic people in mezzo and the american southwest were snake bands literally snake skins they talk to snakes, they they communicate. Men have snake bands all over them. Again, that liminal stuff within it with smoking, hallucinogenic tobacco to go into these states with liminal stuff as well. You've got birds within the world that are liminal, things you'd find also in the spirit world as, as well up here. This is just showing these two Larry birds and that. Ways that both, Birds, snakes, and humans can make what Lewis Williams called transcosmological travel. That just means going to the spirit world or going outside of this, just like what we have with Kuyamunge, where we can spin out into another realm. Want to add anything to that, Todd? So, is this your final slide? Yes, one more. I've got so one more, yeah. Kind of what, what Chris is suggesting here is that in the same way that that drum that the, the shaman is holding from Siberia, the same way that it's alive, these are also alive. 
And so there's a layer upon layer upon layer of this building here. So there are humans who can enter into the spirit world. There are also animals that can enter into these spirit worlds. And so snakes and birds are animals that naturally can enter, they can transcend this world, enter the upper world or enter the lower world. But we can also make these pots and these pots become living entities in and of themselves. This is actually common across uh, North America, South America. It's common across the world. So that, that uh, shaman drum that we were looking at from Siberia, it is a living entity, a human made living entity, but it is a living entity. And what Christine is suggesting is that these pots are also living entities in the same way that that drum was a living entity. Yeah, and um, Pete Hollowell um, talked about with the Ojibwe, other than human persons, and is one way these are other than human persons. So they are kind of like human and have volition kind of like human and are their own name thing. So I often call the Plyus Red stuff pot persons are anyway but that's how we came up that argument there's this idea this called mimic magic that that anthropologists use we see it all over the world and basically the idea is that by re by putting something onto something else by making them look like something else you can actually give that object some sort of power that relates to it and so for example a hunter that is that has uh, a mountain lion um form on his face or, or wearing certain sorts of skin so that there's a little bit of that mountain lion that is now part of the hunter becomes a better hunter because the 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 hunter can have the influence of the mountain lion and well, just can like using that scythe of a jaw of an antelope right exactly. or then employing the powers of flight you have a soul flight well birds are very good at traversing the skies you want to tunnel into the earth well snakes do that already so you're using those powers of the animals around you that already do what you're trying to do and employ them yeah. as as friends and helpers. Absolutely. That's, that, that's called sympathetic magic. Logical. We see it all over the world. We, 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 you know, you, you, you want your car to go fast, we'll paint a stallion on the side of it. <laughs> and it's going to name fast. it a Bronco. <laughs> or, or a Thunderbird. Yeah, Thunderbird. Thunderbird. Yeah, Thunderbird. But, you know, here's what's interesting to me is that um, we know nothing in our community. We're not versed in this. We just come in like, oh, Experiential. you know, I want to trans without using entheogens and da, 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 da. So these things happen to us. Mm -hmm. We're not trying. We're not schooled in this. We're not told ahead of time. We don't know the symbology necessarily, but they just happen. And that's what I'm finding so fascinating. This well, stuff happens innocently when you set up part of and the you human... open a door between the dimensions and mm -hmm. all this takes place and we we fly off to the cosmos. We fly up. We are on the backs of birds or a bear. Mm -hmm. We're taking flight or we're deeping, tunneling it deep into Mother Earth. Right. This stuff happens. How do you explain that? Well, and what Christine is suggesting here is that they chose to make these pots, these pots which are living things, they're shaman mm -hmm. helpers, they decorated them with the imagery of birds and the imagery of snakes specifically so that those pots could make the journeys that the shamans are doing and that the snakes anyway. and the birds naturally can do by associating yeah. these pots with that particular imagery. These pots can actually undergo that spinning experience in the same way that the shamans do. So as because the shamans they have are- a, a form of consciousness. And is this a reciprocal relationship? Oh, Spirits, you have helped me make this flight. Now let me return the favor and do well, this. Well, even even what more than it? that, it's 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 instead that the shaman, you know, in the same way that the the shaman is we'll do this together. Yeah, drum goes with the shaman and yes. helps the shaman make the transition. These pots are filling a similar sort of a thing, and and exactly what they mean within the culture is is perhaps open. A lot of times, shamans will take helpers that will help them gather up lost souls or information and they can put it inside that as a container and they can bring it back into this world. These pots may have served some sort of a function in that the shaman is using them as a, as a, a means of conveyance such that these yeah. pots go with the shaman and act as helpers with the shaman as the shaman gathers up lost souls or gathers gotcha. up spiritual power in some way. So Christine's argument Teamwork. is that it's these pots across the dimensions. Yeah, these pots are literally being spun to do the same sort of thing that the shamans feel when they're being spun. And yeah. so the reason why they're decorated with this counterclockwise sort of emotion that sends them out into the cosmos, 
is because these pots will literally encounter that experience the same way that the shamans do. So the shamans can transcend this world, so can these pots. And these pots are decorated with the animals that allow them to transcend this world. They're decorated with the shapes, the, the you know, the spiraling motion that allows them to transcend this world. They're associated with the shamans so that they can transcend this world. And in fact, these are specifically Just designed to go with the shamans. To deepening, transcend. The whole, deepening the whole thing. And that thus can be decoded. Mm -hmm. right? right. We can understand right. better the layers of meaning and purpose and ritual and the position in the cosmology that these play, right? The role they play. So it's, cool, but it's, it's a combination of that... the role of the shaman and the artist coming together because yeah. that, that artistic expression that, that, that triggers you from the internal mission and, and connectedness, mm -hmm. the connectedness. Um, you know, I, as we, every time we explore this topic and every time we look down this path, immediately I just feel instilled with hope, with 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 intuition, with understanding, because while we don't take the time to document this stuff, and and when I say we, I mean Western civilization, uh, and and this time and space, when we look back and say this simplistic way of bringing out those elements of experience of the human condition, the human story, uh, is so powerful and so needed to be recognized and brought forward again in a way, so that the the modern world of art. The modern world of 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 internal healing, the modern world of, of shamanic experiences, all comes together again, and, and there's a re, there's a reuniting, a, a marriage again. Well, and also hopefully a resetting of our relationship, right, with our right. world, yeah, in a healthier Exciting. way, right. Mm -hmm. So, That's oh. cool. please, please continue. <laughs> um, one other thing, because Laura pre talk asked about, um, let's see if I can get it to go. Throughout the Casas Grandes world, and especially off Hakime, we have things called platform hearths. They stick up off the floor. Um, sometimes they'll have holes in it where you can hang stuff. So you have a small ash box or small um, chunks of charcoal sitting there burning. So you can cook in these. But often we find there are places where pots were put. Some of them are beautiful. They look like spirals themselves mm -hmm. or look almost like a horn plume serpent. Some of these are called effigy platforms. And so oh. some of us in the Costas area think that a lot of houses have these household ritual shrines. They're both one for cooking and heating within, especially in the wintertime. But it may be that these are household shrines where pots are being spun, looked at, and doing it. And so in Costas Grandes area, a lot of stuff is this Ramos polychrome. Often they're not FG. Often they're just got geometrics on them. But the Potters were so incredibly talented that what they did was they kind of engineered a pot one size fits all. So you could take a Ramos um, polychrome, you could have it to hold water, you could also cook with it, you could do a lot of different things with, with the pot. They're found in every type of context at, at Pakime. Something called Ramos black, which is basically almost a plius red, but they're just black, they're in reduced. Only the Ramos black was in 100% um, ritual context, things like burials or stuff like that. So the Ramos polychrome is being used in household. It's what's carrying all this information. It's also used in grave goods. So one of the things I think is happening is that a lot of people at Pakime in the past probably had these notions, probably had ideas, and the pottery is functional, but also carrying this symbolic information, carrying the codes and the tradition. There's a lot of information just on the geometrics going on at, at Pakime. So a lot of information I know, but anyways, that's kind of my argument in a nutshell. And Shai, Is that you? because that their household daily tasks were also imbued with the sacred, a sense of I'm, I'm here performing my daily tasks, but it's in um, it's an honor of this great cosmos. It's an honor of being in harmony. It's an honor of being in right relationship with everything and all the layers of reality. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. No separation there. Mm. That would be a beautiful way to live. Yeah. You did get the question of whether the shaman was the artist as well. You know, that's an interesting question. Was the shaman an artist as well? Maybe. Um, I will say, though, that when you get to these um, jars that are painted in form, this takes a lot of specialized knowledge and probably takes people 
time, knowledge, um, craftsmanship. What I suspect happens is that the one of our colleagues, Maria Sprin, has talked about in Mesoamerica, we have something called attached specialist, means you're attached to an elite who has some amount of social status and can pay you to do um, make pottery. And probably in the Casas Grandes area, I think like in the Maya area, you have these shaman style leaders, so shaman leaders. And the shaman leaders, like Mezzo, I think with Pakime, have shaman leaders. They have enough resources that they can have attached specialists with them that they can say, hey, I have this vision. This is what I'm seeing. Can you paint it on a picture? And, you know, they sketch it out in sand or on something, and then the potters go and make it. That's what I think is But happening. it's also one symbolic language that's shared among the whole culture, I'm assuming. Maybe there's other specialized um, secret knowledge among certain clans or certain groups. But this is one shared language, is it not? So everybody can read these symbols or most of them, maybe? Maybe, maybe not. Um, that's an interesting question. So this, this iconography right here with the smoking effigy vessels, I have recorded 50 smoker effigy vessels. The Makai effigies, there are a few more. And this one right here, this fully transferred one, this is the only one like it. And so this is really rare. This came out of a burial north of Pocky May. This is actually in um, Los Angeles uh, County. It's in the Los Angeles County of natural, of natural History. It's sitting there in that museum. I talked to the person who collected it, sold it to that museum. Um, yeah, and I think that there probably was some secret knowledge, but when you get to, I wish I had just a typical- the Layers course. of it, right? The common knowledge and then the, the secret knowledge of according to various clans. That's how the native world is organized today as well, isn't it? But yeah, absolutely. were most of these found as grave goods or household? I mean, where were they found, uh, the majority of them or some of them? Just the plain Oyas, which I wish I just had a, a typical Oya- um, present, I should put in my slideshow, in retrospect, but a lot of them just have geometrics. Interlocking steps are things that look like this on it. Interlocking steps, um, swirls like this, they're really hard to read. They're just geometric, but they're pairs of geometrics. So most of the jars in all contexts are the geometrics. That's what people were using every day, what's going in the burials as well, for the most part. And then you have, uh, so you have the layer of what we call duality. So Todd and I talked about Casas Grandes Medio people like pairs of pairs duality going over and over. Everybody knows that. Everyone sees these things. And probably mm -hmm. everyone would knew this. This is probably a real person. Todd and I did a bunch of statistical analysis of the clothing and the facial features in the designs. Oh, on interesting. And we found that the faces and designs on the humans there is so much variation that to explain the variation, they would have had to been actual individuals. Because if it was a god, just like mm -hmm. the horn plume serpent, and you always know what a horn plume serpent is because it has a four pointed horn and these plumes are backward horns coming off them. You know what they look like. There's some variation in them, but they have these things. But anyway, so we suggest that this is probably was a, a actual person with his red sandals on doing a stance. So people would have actually probably seen the person that maybe that person represented that pot actually mm -hmm. going out. This is not a God. This was a human that probably lived and is a representation. You want to add something to that, Todd? Well, you would ask whether these are typically found in um, burials or other contexts. And the truth be known, they're found in almost every context. So they, they on occasion are found in burials, uh, but that's certainly not the only place that they're located. Uh, they're, they're just found in every context of daily life. And Fred is saying, Fred Smith is saying, I know that in India, at least, manufacturing shamanic materials are not made by single individuals, but by teams of specialists. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, too. And we know from yeah. the American Southwest, uh, Maria Martinez, um, her industry was with her husband and her son. And so that's a case where we see um, teams. Most likely, these are teams, too, of uh, people doing this pottery production. That makes sense. Yeah. Maybe the shamanic group goes and commissions some pottery, as you mm -hmm. said, to the specialists or have favorites, favorite artisans. And it is interesting to me, and this is just me talking, um, so I'm not speaking for Christine here, but some of the very most beautiful pots in the region are related to the sort of shamanic theme, and they are incredible. And you know whoever made that was 
one of the best skilled potters that ever lived in the Southwest. But then you can get other things that are rather um, less well-developed, closer to my skill level, uh, as opposed to this incredible skill level. And I do wonder if on occasion, shamans who might not necessarily be particularly good potters don't make some things either for themselves or just in general compared to these specialists. And so it, it may, it's probably, I, I think, and and Chris is, um, Chris is far smarter and far more capable of making these sorts of arguments, and she's not 100% sold on it. But I think it's possible that there could actually be different groups of people making different things for different purposes at different times. And um, and so, you know, perhaps sometimes, uh, Tony, in answer your question, perhaps sometimes, yes, it's the shaman making stuff, but perhaps a lot of times it's somebody who's really skilled making things that the shaman described to them or working with the shaman to make it the way that ought to. And perhaps there's something like what Fred was saying, where there's groups of people who get together and you got somebody who's really skilled and other people and they're working it all out. Um, so it's probably Maybe not- Maybe a shaman expensive. gets a vision and needs a particular vessel and experiments with it first and then becomes part of the, the tradition. Who knows? Mm. Right? It could be all sorts of answers. Sure. Should we go to open? Are, are, is there more slides to share? No, nope, that's it. I try to oh, keep- yeah. Try to really fly. Yeah, congratulations. Short. Let me escape. I got you. Yeah. And again, I just want to say the, the many layers of uh, evidence that you support your, your vision with um, really powerful and it really gives you a sense of the culture and its sophistication and its depth and its long, long history with this, mm. um, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful presentation. Thank you both. I mean, I know, Christine, you're, uh, the depth of your research and taking the time to go through. And when you first talked about it uh, to us verbally, I was thinking, She's taking pictures of the bottoms of the pots because I always would assume that it's the it's the all of the imagery on oh, the top okay. of the pot when you're talking about the spinning. But when you showed the imagery How today, and you showed the and when you showed all the swirling coming down to the very base of the pot, amazing! Uh, it really adds uh, depth to the. I know that one thing Christine asked for was, "Hey, among our community that does the ritual posture work with right. us, we talk about that. do you want? Well, you have questions for them as well, right? About their experiences with spiraling and absolutely um, their yeah. thoughts on the spiraling hypothesis is this does this make sense with their own practice with Kuyamange? Yeah. I mean it makes sense to me and I think I could maybe say with Laura because we both have cases where we spin off somewhere as part of the whole entoptic but also the perception I mean feeling the wind but also feeling you're spinning in wind it can also happen where it's mm -hmm. you know all the senses are coming together it's really quite remarkable that we can have those um, sensations in ritual body postures I mean real sensations yeah, yeah. real sensations I mean your are body is holding still holding a posture but yeah. you inside <laughs> are are spinning and yeah, yeah. So let's hear from uh, some of them. Do you okay, want to make sure let's have, this? let's have, first of all, let's ask just questions and comments that we've had had time to get to because we've been listening to the presentation. So this is the time to raise your hand using the Zoom function, raising your hand. And uh, even if it's just um, uh, acknowledging. Caroline, it looks like comments. I saw a flash up. I don't want to be sitting here with my face in it, but she's spun a few times, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah, I don't know where the Zoom function is, but I know where the mute button is. <laughs> Oh, hi, Ashley. Go. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you. I'm wondering about, um, the, 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 you know, the, of course, the pots are basically made from clay, which is of the earth. And then as far as the spinning of the pot and the clay, does, is that, is there like a drawing up of power from, from the earth? Interesting with, question. With yeah. this uh, motion and the, uh, with the motion and the material being of the earth. Um, I wonder if well, that's an element. Uh, this paper's building on a bunch of other papers. So in 2012, I had a paper with an art historian, Elizabeth Newsom. And when I was at the Santa Fe Institute, I was talking to her about how Pueblo and people talk about clay is earth mother. And so many, I was telling the story at SFI many years ago, Todd and I were at Zuni, New Mexico. Was this about 92? 91? Probably close to 94. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Didn't. We were out and Bob Early Leonard days. arranged for us to go with a Zuni potter to collect clay because one of the grad students was going to analyze the clay. So we set up off one morning from 
the plaza, the main area of um, Zuni. And we went on a really weird route. And I think it's because he didn't want us to know where the play source was exactly. And it was great. So we hiked up this mountainside. We went around. And I am answering your problem, your question, I promise, oh, yeah. how my brain worked and how I end up where I'm at today. <sighs> anyway, so we, we walk up. And I've been watching, and my dad was a minor for part of my young childhood and my middle school years and high school. So I was in and out of a silver mine. I hiked over all over New Mexico. I, I was really a feral child. I was outside all the time. But we're walking and walking. I'm looking for a clay deposit. I don't see anything. And then the gentleman, this young Zuni male, really lovely person said, take off your socks and shoes, please. And what do you do when someone says, take off your socks and shoes? You take off your so socks and shoes. So we took off our socks and shoes, all of us in the party. And he started saying a prayer in Zuni, sprinkling stuff and um, stuff was going on. And then he said, okay, um, let's go in. And he pulls this bush off to the side. And it looks like a living, healthy bush, but obviously it's not a living bush because he moved it. And then we walked in, we ducked in to white clay kaolinite, the bestest of the clay kaolinite. And I was just in awe. I think my mouth probably hit the floor, but I'm in awe. You can see where they're taking steps and taking clay through time out of this. And then the person who was doing the research asked the gentleman, um, what was that prayer? And he goes, oh, I'm asking that you be gentle with mother earth, that your science be true. They only take what you need for your research. And this is the earth mother. Mm -hmm. And when we give to earth mother, we have to reciprocate and give her something from one of her sisters. So I gave corn pollen because that comes from her sister, corn maiden. And this is the story he told. And it was very powerful. And we collected our clay. And then he put back the bush. And then we put back our socks and shoes. And he took us out a really strange way back to where we needed to be. Um, but I knew from going up to New Mexico and buying pottery that women would hold their potteries and they would call them potteries and not pots, but potteries. And I knew that a lot of the people talked about these as animate beings and pot babies. So I heard about pot babies. I heard about potteries and all this is uh, intertwined. And so Frank Hamilton Cushing, one of the very first ethnographers coming out of the Smithsonian, the very first anthropological journey to the wander places of Zuni, he went out there and he asked uh, women, why are you putting stuff in the fire with your pottery? Because they would make um, offerings to clay. And the, the Zuni potter told Frank Hamilton Cushion, oh, we ask fire to be gentle, to be kind, to be nice, because it could um, consume the pot and break it. And we don't want to have a broken being. But Stephen Trimble has a really nice book on that. And it's one of the things with my paper with Elizabeth Newsom that I talked about is that these pot persons are part Mother Earth. They're water. They are um, birth through fire. Oh, and while you're doing clay, the selfish clay, you have an interaction. So part of the potter is left. So when I teach this in class, I suggest these pot persons are like humans that have children. It's a little bit of the two people with children. Same thing with the potter. It's clay as one of the ancestral things. It's also the human spirit. It's also fire and it creates this new made being like this own person. And that's our 2012 article in American Antiquity. But yes, so all that's how it's put in. And then at Pakime, we have our big reservoir and in the bottom of the reservoir is a shaft. And on top of the shaft, of the reservoir is a rock. And under that is a very plain, smooth plyus red. So no incising plyus red. It's wearing a necklace like what we find on humans in the burials. So me and Elizabeth suggest that this is a pot person who is saying prayers, is interacting between the underwatery world yeah. and the upper world to keep that reservoir full of water. And that because it's dressed like a human, it is symbolically a human, just like with the modern Pueblos talk about the, their potteries. And there's a wonderful quote in uh, Stephen Trimble's book with, they talk about, would you, if you have a crack, would you throw your grandpa away? No, you put it on your shelf. It's not good enough for uh, tourists, but it's good enough for us because it's one of our people. And I thought that was a really interesting one out of the Tewa speakers of New Mexico.
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the great, great explanation and the, and the narrative. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, we have several hands up. We got Bonnie, Fred, and Tony. Uh, why don't we go uh, ladies first? Oh, Bonnie, yeah, here we go. Can you put your uh, camera on and go, go ahead? And I'll go to the other two gentlemen. There you are, Bonnie. There I am. So I wanted to say that, wow, Christine, this is just so wonderful to listen to and to have my mind expanded with. And the, the fact that you recognize the pots as living beings, I'm certain that you're like, getting information from them and that is such how 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 should i say that how happy they must be that yeah. someone acknowledges them because for so long you know at least in our culture we do not recognize these things but you recognize them as the being that they are and wow they must really enjoy that so the other thing i wanted to mention was and I'm, I came a little late, so maybe you discussed this already. Is that birds and snakes are you know they're related all over the world as going together, and one of the reasons is is that they have similar structures in the brains, so the bone structures. So obviously our ancestors were hunter gatherers, and they would have noticed that. And I think that that is one of the reasons that they are combined in so many places all over the world, because you look at the snake who is the epitome of a ground dwelling creature. And then you look at the bird who is the epitome of the free flying creature and they are related. So how did one, how do they flow into each other? Mm -hmm. So I, I want to mention that. And then for the spirals, I just stand up to catch my breath. For <laughs> the, the spirals, it was very interesting for me that you mentioned that because my husband is going through a pretty big spiritual change. And just recently, he started to draw spirals on his shoes and he's not into symbols like I am or like we are here. And he just started to do it. And uh, I found it really interesting how he's drawing spirals on his shoes. And what could that mean? Because the spiral is such an important symbol in transformation. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, I didn't get into that in either paper because you have limited words. I was at my max of my words in my article. You're absolutely right. There's so much information with spirals for liminality and transformation and rejuvenation and, and everything you said that there's so many cultures use the spiral for all those things. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. He's doing on his shoes. Is he going to walk somewhere with that? <laughs> He's just using them in everyday life. It's his everyday shoes. That's wonderful. Yeah. Interesting. Well, thank you again for thank your you. fabulous talk. Thank you, and Bonnie. Keep at yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Wow. Okay. Well, we got Tony and Fred, and you know both of them are going to have very interesting insights and questions. Okay, Tony, here's your chance. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, well, not so much an insight, but but something I kept on noticing. Uh, we have this ramp. Well, two things. There's absolutely beautiful transition from linear to curvilinear form. I mean, I've, I've not seen uh, that really any place other than in pots. It's not in rock art, at least not that I customarily see. Just a beautiful transition, one flowing into the other. And I think that's interesting. And then, of course, we have the ramp uh, that we see, the angle. Uh, and there's, an, there's a metric associated with that. I just wonder if you've looked at the distribution of that and if there's any, any uh, commonality or any cluster of what that angle would be. Or is it purely, uh, purely just at the convenience of the, the pot diameter and height? Yeah, that's a great um, question. As you know, a lot of cultures really think that 45 degree angle is really important for symbolic reasons. And I have not measured it from rim or bottom to look at the exact angle. And that's something that I've been wanting to do. I think it's really important. But to answer your question, no, I haven't looked at the angles. But 
I would hypothesize because of the importance of 45 degrees and also 60 degrees, another big one archaeologists talk about that I would suspect either one of those angles we're going to see, but I would really need to go back and do my math. And I know we can do it statistically because Todd and I looked at difference between male and female effigies and the females have really broad hips and the males have broad shoulders. And we actually just measured across the pots based on the hips at where they're sitting are the shoulders at the rim. So I think we can really do that even just from the pot to say that our level is going to be here at the rim and we're going to measure the angles. We could really do that statistically. We've yeah. already done that in other types of um, the iconography at Costas, but that's a really interesting question. And um, I like to do that. The other thing I would say that a lot of people don't, and of course I love pottery, but to be able to, to create even a perfect spiral on a curved surface, these people are so talented and they're so able to do things. I mean, I've tried to do, do pottery and, you know, painting and to also just do straight lines on something that's curved. I mean, it looks to your eye straight, a lot of skill to, to do that. And so there's a lot more going on with that, but being able to put things in the right direction on them is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. The angle looked to me to be uh, far sharper than that, more like between 20 and 30 degrees, not not at 45. Yeah, uh, I was and, thinking about the, um, the bird wing, and I, I guess we'd have to figure out on that curvature because they're also curving too. We're on that thing because the it the wing itself is curving. And the other thing with the spiral right. is they're curving in and of themselves on the pot. So if you take it here, it's going to be a different angle than if you take it here or if you take it here. Does that make sense? Some of them have interesting sure. angles it does, but, but, the angle. but I was I was particularly looking at the linear into curvilinear, where where you yeah. actually have something that you could measure and you're not picking an arbitrary point. Uh, you yeah. might want yeah. more near the origin, the base of the pot. Uh, just, just thinking it's interesting, and the latitude, the latitude at Casas Grandes is just about 30 degrees. I thought I would mention that. I don't know if that means anything, but here, but here my astro nerd self comes in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very you know, much. Oh, you're welcome. I will, we'll write, Todd's writing it down for us. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wonderful. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. Tony always has some. Great pointed yeah. questions that no, moves the conversation that. along. Yeah. Uh, we're coming to the end of our presentation, but I still wanted to, Tony had another follow-up and Bonnie had a follow-up and then we can go yeah. from there. Okay. Uh, Tony? Uh, yeah, real real quickly, uh, could you give a, a one minute timeline of Casas Grandes and all these things that we're seeing just to place it in context of everything else? Real quick, prior to 880, 1200, the Casas Grandes region is more or less the similar to the other sorts of uh, subsistence farming uh, cultures throughout the Southwest. And so it, it looks very similar to what you find up in the Members region or in the El Paso region, those sorts of, of cultures. Starting about AD 1200, there is a lot of concentration of populations, especially around Pakime. That's not all there is, but there's a significant part of that. Um, then about AD 1250, Pakime gets uh, restructured so that it is larger, more impressive, monumental architecture is being built, built there, and it becomes a, a location that's special on the landscape. That continues on through AD 1375, AD 1400, where things seem to change again. By AD 1450, um, and probably earlier than that, I'm going to guess AD 1425, um, the Pakimi is simply abandoned. And it's never reoccupied. This, the community is systematically burned. The community is closed. Uh, and uh, it just simply is gone. It's it's done. And so what it looks like is happening is that uh, about uh, AD 1200, thereabouts, there's a continuation of some previously existing uh, cultural traditions as some Mesoamerican influence comes in and as people start to adopt Mesoamerican style religious uh, ideas and traditions. So we see things like eye-shaped ball courts and, and other su such things as part of the reorganization of Pakime. So Pakime is not the only site in the Casas Grandes region, but it becomes a ceremonial center in the Casas Grandes region that's closely tie, uh, tied to certain sorts of pottery and certain sorts of architecture. And then that spreads out across the region as the folks there at Pakimi kind of set themselves up as a special place on the landscape associated with the water and this sort of ritual. And, like and I suppose the Chacoan connection. 
Yeah. Well, that goes earlier. And so. No, it's just about one's going down when the other's coming yes, up. Yes, yes, that I agree. And um, Steve Lexon suggests that people went from Chaco to Aztec, New Mexico, down to Pacame. I don't know about that or not. I just know that, yeah, Chaco's already pretty much done by the time Pacame's rising. I see. Interesting. And, wow. Yeah, but, but there was no interaction that we can see. Not not clearly in our mind. Uh, Lexon suggests that there is. Uh, but if if the folks at Pakime actually came from Chaco, they set up a new shop and a new ritual style. And so uh, at Chaco, they didn't have, for example, the ball courts and as much evidence of the sort of Mesoamerican inspired religious traditions, recognizing that they did have things like cacao and whatnot. Uh, yeah. What was happening at, Cha at Pakime is quite distinct relative to what was happening at Chaco. Yeah. yeah, and Pocky May probably shares at least iconographically a lot with members people, and then people from West Mexico. We have genetic studies now that places Pocky May in alignment with people at Pocky May in West Mexico again. So these would have been in West Mexico, just due south of Pocky May, but we have genetic evidence for that members Mugion connection and West Mexico connections genetically. In, in our opinion, it would be more accurate to look at the Casas Grandes system as a continuation of the Membris system as opposed to the Chacoan system. Yeah, I, I had thought that, I, I, though, having spent so much time in Chaco, I had to ask if there was anything. Yeah, exactly. I love Chaco. I wish we could make it work. And Tepesa wanted it to be contemporaneous with uh, Chaco. And so there was problems, not that it was a problem, but we refined our dendrochronology dating um, a lot. And so Pakime likes really perfectly round vigas. And so sometimes the center of the tree is right here off kilter, but they're shaving the outer rings to make the, the things perfectly round. And as a result, you, we lost from the outer rings. So the dating was a little bit wonky for dendrochronology. Um, the Arizona lab, tree Ling lab talked about this, about how the dating was a little bit problematic. And so Tepesa was looking at these dates and he could go with the ceramic evidence where the polychromes are contemporaneous with Salado polychrome, which we now know they are, or he could go with the hypothesized dating from the tree ring lab with missing outer rings. And he used those to make it contemporaneous with, with Chaco Canyon. But we now know through subsequent work done by the tree ring lab that yeah, it's later than uh, Chaco. Yeah, wow. Oh, thanks, Tony. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, and then Bond, you had a final comment as well? Yes. So I wanted to speak on tobacco. Um, I grow tobacco many different kinds, and I grow the rustica as well as others. And my experience with them in ritual and just growing them is that tobacco is a great communicator and it really facilitates communicating between the worlds. Um, I don't need to use a lot of tobacco. I don't need to spin to go into that connection. And just a little bit will will get you there. And so while I understand for really intense spiritual work, perhaps you want to overdose with tobacco, but you can go with just small amounts. And I think that our ancestors also use just small amounts at times as well. Right. But it's one of those plants that I find that once you start to grow it, it's like you start to grow like all the different varieties. It just wants, it tells you it wants you to grow it, all of them. And I've had that experience with many friends who started with just the rustica and now it's like they grow all of the species. So tobacco, yeah, okay. It's such a beautiful plant too. I know that was- Yes, yes. The flowers, yeah. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Thank Great. you. Uh, wow. And Todd, Christine, uh, Christine, uh, your research uh, and, and both of you together, the work, how you work together, always inspiring. So um, <laughs> let's continue spinning together. <laughs> and uh, seeing what the we'll see what rises up and what we experience. Well, in it's a... fascinating just to hear all the nuances and all the pieces of data and how do you put it together and how fragmented the picture is. But then you dig deep enough and something's emerging of of a picture and spinning up like snakes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you yeah, go. Yeah. So thank you. Well, and so. I'm sure as Tony would point out, I mean the world everything is spinning. 
there's no there's no such thing as stagnant stagnant yeah. space. It's always We're moving. The Everything's in motion. On a so planet, why would it not be represented in our experiences in every way go. possible for us to connect to the universe? Yeah. All Thank right. Final thoughts. You too. We're appreciative. Thank you yes, for having thanks. us. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank uh, everyone for weighing in. I appreciate it. And Todd appreciates it too. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Take care. Keep on spinning. Thank you.